www.thepatriotmedia.com. Uh, next guest for my show, Michelle Turman, uh, who began her career in the museum field and distinguished herself by receiving the Businesswoman of the Year Award by the Tampa Bay Business Journal. After 13 years of museum management with a focus on curating exhibitions, fundraising administrations and working for various organizations she moved into the health and human services industry after serving serving as an effective change agent for various nonprofit organizations she formed catalyst consulting services michelle welcome to the show today hey good morning so let's start a little bit with your background I mean, we shared a, a great a discussion prior to the show about your role with uh, the titanic and so you're involved for 13 years i think it was in the museum and curation business so tell me about your role with uh, the titanic Sure. Um, well, basically, I have my undergraduate degrees in art history and uh, worked in museum management. And I was actually consulting at the time and was asked to actually curate the show that came here to St. Petersburg in Titanic. Okay. And ultimately went to work uh, for the company and curated all their exhibitions worldwide as well as their expeditions that they would conduct to the north atlantic now when you say summer. the company we're talking about the the ship that actually found the titanic out in sea correct this is rms titanic incorporated okay. and they have the salver and possession rights and so they are the only company allowed to salvage the wreck okay uh, and have videos for the wreck um, anybody can go on a tourist dive, but they are the only ones allowed to do that as well as exhibit the artifacts worldwide. Okay, so your role with them was to curate and put the, the artifacts from the wreckage on display, am I correct? Correct. So tell me a little bit about, were you there when they first made the initial discovery? I was not there. That was Bob Ballard. Okay. Um, I actually was with the company from 1998 till about 2003. And we actually conducted the largest expedition, though, in 2000. So it was the largest one ever assembled. We were out there for eight weeks, and we discovered about 1,300 artifacts that eventually went on display. So all in all, there have been about 15 expeditions to Titanic that occur um, during the July-August time frame, and we were the largest in 2000. Okay, what was some? Tell me about some of the artifacts uh, that you personally handled uh, in in your uh, in, in the museum and curation business. Sure. Oh, there's been many. You know, I have curated shows from uh, Russian museums and Egyptian to Greek, but Titanic is probably the one that gets talked about the most. So I have handled everything from sarcophagi to uh, oils and perfumes from the Titanic, and I think that was probably the most remarkable find that I've ever discovered. Um, that came up on a dive, and when that actually came up on the submersible, um, some of the vials came intact, and some of the vials were actually, unfortunately, did not make it due to the weather conditions. And uh, for lack of a better phrase, you could actually smell Titanic, if you would. And these were oils that were originally transported by a passenger, um, front, they were coming over to New York, in fact, to sell them at Macy's. And so that was a pretty phenomenal artifact to then eventually put on display where people could smell these oils um, and see that. So it's, it's really ranged from a variety of different things. And I think the access, quite frankly, has been really phenomenal as a curator to be able to work on these collections throughout the world. Is it, as you bring the artifacts up from the sea, is there a risk of instant deterioration? I've heard stories of where if you don't bring them up properly, I mean, they can crumble when they hit the air. Tell me a little bit about the different types of products, you know, where the artifacts as you bring them up to the surface. I mean, do they, are they at risk of, you know, decaying immediately when they hit the air after the prolonged exposure undersea? Mm -hmm. Well, for underwater uh, excavation, which Titanic is, Absolutely, because they're really in the perfect conditions right now. They're two and a half miles underwater. There's no light to deteriorate those artifacts, and it's extremely cold water. So when you're bringing them up to the surface, the conditions change. You now have sunlight. You now have warmer water. So once you bring them up from the, from the bottom of the ocean, then you need to put them in similar conditions if you can. Some of the different materials that can deteriorate um, and to what you're saying are wood, for example, paper, um, but some of the more hardier artifacts, if you will, such as metal, such as uh, glass or porcelain, are actually quite sturdy. Um, but it all happens once you conserve them at the surface and how they're handled um, over the next, really, six months. And depending on the material 
depends on how long it takes to conserve before the the public actually gets to see it. Now, who has ownership rights to the artifacts? I had asked uh, off the air, and I just I think it was a, a good discussion point. I mean, do the heirs have any claims of rights to these artifacts, or does the company that uh, excavates these artifacts have sole uh, ownership uh, rights to the uh, to the artifacts? The company, by virtue of the District Court of Norfolk, Virginia, has granted them the sovereign possession rights, is what it is called, which is very different from uh, maritime rights right now, which is usually finders keepers, if you will. Um, however, I will tell you that I've met uh, many, although there's not many now, but many survivors or uh, daughters or granddaughters of survivors over the years. And it was always the goal of the company to, um, once you could delineate where that artifact came from, to work with those individuals. And ultimately, they decided that it was always best to keep it with the company. They really didn't have the money to conserve the artifact. They wanted it to be shared with the public. Um, of course, you would always have individuals who felt strongly about the site not being excavated, but uh, we really tried hard at that time to work with any of the survivors of the families. But yes, in this particular case, when it comes to Titanic, there is someone that has the rights, and that's RMS Titanic Incorporated. Okay, and you said that uh, the artifacts are not available to be sold, correct? They can't correct. make profits off of these uh, artifacts, correct? They, they have can, to strictly be for display, right? They have to be for display, for public consumption. There has been discussion over the past years to sell them. If they ever did sell them, it would have to be changed by mandate of the court, number one. And number two, they'd have to be sold as a full lot, and it's a quite expensive collection um, but it has never occurred okay and now you received the uh, businesswoman of the year award by the Tampa Bay Business Journal was that for your role as a uh, museum curator tell me about this and how you received that award actually it was um, it was in the role actually of a CEO of a museum uh, I was the CEO of the Gulf Coast Museum of Art and had received that wonderful nomination and uh, I think it was credited with how we had changed quite frankly that museum their exhibition schedule and was able to really turn that institution around and so we were recognized as such for the arts and culture award okay and now today you are involved in assisting nonprofits grow their organizations through your company catalyst consulting services so how did you make that transition from a museum curator with the uh, RMS Titanic uh, company and get involved with uh, assisting nonprofit organizations sure well, you know, museums in its essence are nonprofits, and so I've been doing it for 21 years. But for me, it was the jump from more the historian side to the business side, and quite frankly, it was the experience with Titanic that did that. Really was able to be pushed more into the fundraising side, the operational side, working with large sponsors, funding expeditions, and realized that that was a very important side to make things happen. So as much as we say nonprofit is not for a profit, you do have to make a profit to keep it in business. And so I was basically pushed into the field of fundraising and operations. And what I found at that level was you could facilitate change, significant change at the CEO or COO level, um, especially if you were able to raise money. It's just as similar as you're doing here. You have to have sponsors to put on your radio show. So those were three major components. And I've had the privilege to not only work with art organizations, but health and human service organizations. And what I found I was very good at and something that I enjoy is helping organizations achieve their, their fullest potential. And the way to do that is really at the level of working with the board and working with the CEO and working with the COO to facilitate rapid change. And so I decided a year and a half ago after working with other organizations to formulate my own company um, you're starting to see right now in the area with nonprofits mergers because, quite frankly, a lot of these nonprofits cannot fund themselves. There's a limited amount of resources. You're looking at strategic alliances with nonprofits. You're also starting to see many CEOs who have been with organizations starting to retire. And so there's a change in guard, and there's been no succession plan. And so all of these pieces from fundraising to strategic alliances and mergers to really preparing the organization for those changes, I saw as a true need. Okay. So there's many consultants in the area um, that do strategic planning and so on, and, and I do offer that. But I think where I've been able to be successful is that I'm a past CEO and COO. So I can speak the language of somebody that's running the company and have been in their shoes. And the reality is, is that hiring decisions, making budget, raising money just to keep the doors open, 
you know, it's not as exciting as the programmatic side or like we talked about Titanic. But unfortunately, you have to do that to keep it the business running. Right. Now, I'm at your website, CatalystCS.org. People mm-hmm. can learn more about you over at that website, CatalystCS.org. And I'm looking at uh, your services. Explain your services and things that you offer. You, so you come in as a consultant. So talk to me about how you would assist, uh, you know, my, I don't have a nonprofit, but let's say I'm a startup nonprofit. How would you assist a startup nonprofit, for instance? So I do have some clients that are, are startups, or I would say that um, were maybe founded just by a mother and a father who, let's say, for example, lost their child to cancer and they want to start funding cancer research. Um, you know, I really work with them to put together a plan in place for the first year of operations. Everything from establishing your 501c3 to how you're going to build the board and get people from the community involved with your cause to how you're going to fundraise for success, as well as look at their best practices. So I actually have a few clients that are startups to see how they can become successful, maybe potentially become a more sophisticated nonprofit or align themselves with somebody who does similar research. Um, in those standpoints. Yeah, I'm over again at your website again, catalystcs.org. I see one of you, you have many clients here. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them, because of Ezra, I mm-hmm. actually had had uh, Kyle Matthews mm-hmm. uh, on my uh, show, and I think you were just referencing, you probably had him in mind where you were just talking about because yeah. he had lost, him and his wife had lost his uh, 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 child to uh, childhood mm-hmm. cancer. Uh, it was a great interview, and he formed because of Ezra. How involved are you with uh, because of Ezra? Um, Well, I was helping them exactly with what we just talked about. They are ready to take it to the next level. They've done a phenomenal job in their fundraising efforts, um, but it's just the two of them. And there always comes a point in a nonprofit where do you grow and invite more people into your cause. So if you can do that, then they are going to be able to raise more money for cancer research. And so they're at that point. So I actually had worked with them to formulate a business plan of what they could do to move that forward. Uh, building a board of, of community leaders here in the Tampa Bay area, what that looks like, what those board members need to be doing, um, hiring professional staff, and really, I guess, creating, for lack of a better word, a roadmap for them so that when they're ready to take that nonprofit to the next level, they now have that roadmap and provide also training for them and best practices. Because what you find in nonprofit is there's definitely there's the heart and there's the head. And in the case of Because of Ezra, their, their heart is completely in it, obviously, for personal reasons. And so sometimes you need to take that next business step so that they can really expand their mission and do even more good work in the community. And well, that's where I come in. Uh, some great information there. Uh, stay uh, tuned. I'm going to take a quick break, but we're currently talking with uh, Michelle Terman, principal consultant and founder of Catalyst Consulting Services. And you're listening to That Business Show with Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Bud Spriggs and Movement Mortgage want you to experience the thrill of one-day underwriting and the comfort in knowing your loans will be clear to close in record time. While a competition looks to a lost closing date, Bud Spriggs and Movement Mortgage focus on their 12-day clear to close. They do this by utilizing their world-class operations staff to underwrite your loan within six hours, process your loan in 12 days, and have your loan closed in time. Underwritten in six hours, cleared to close in 12 days. Bud Spriggs and Movement Mortgage. Hey there, it's Lynn Wise, the founder of Wise Business Advisors and Contractor Business Alliance. I am a certified value builder advisor, and I help business owners build a company that will allow them to have the business that they dreamed of when they started. Why did you go into business for yourself? I'm sure it was not to work 100 hours a week with no work-life balance and no financial freedom. What am I talking about? I'm talking about building a business that provides value to you and your family now and in the future. You can learn about the eight essential areas of a business that you must build to have a business that can be an asset for your future. Go to wisebusinessadvisors.com and take the Value Builder score. It is free and will deliver your score immediately on how you are doing on building a valuable business for you and your family. Or call me at 772-834-8513 to learn more about the Value Builder system. Tampa Bay weather is a roof killer. That's why when getting your roof done, you want it done right. Hi, I'm Jamie Maloney of That Business Show. When considering a new roof or repair, talk to Westfall Roofing. They've been installing high-quality roofs in Tampa Bay for over 25 years. Get a free, no-obligation estimate by calling 855-99-ROOFING. That's 855-99-ROOFING. Find out what already 15,000 satisfied customers already know. Call now, 
855-99-ROOFING. Are you in need of new flooring or ready to tackle that home remodeling project? Then contact Jaeger & Company Incorporated, a family-owned, state-certified general contracting business with over 70 years of experience and the recipient of the Angie's List Super Service Award for the last eight years in multiple categories. Jaeger & Company comes to you with their Shop at Home Flooring Sales Service and their hardwood flooring refinishing is the very best in the Bay. Kitchen and bath design featuring American-made well-born cabinets and all work is done by employees, not subcontractors. Learn more at JaegerFlooring.com. Are you looking for a local real estate firm that knows the market and has your interests in mind? Then contact Jim McPeak at McPeak Real Estate Firm, a family-owned business whose agents have over 60-plus years of experience in the Tampa Bay market. Many of the agents are military veterans that know the VA process for buying a home and are proud to help our military members in any way they can. From residential to commercial real estate, McPeak Real Estate Firm is here to help. Contact Jim at 813-495-3875 and learn more at mcpeakteam.com. Have you considered a reverse mortgage as part of your retirement financial plan? For homeowners age 62 or older, a reverse mortgage from Access Reverse Mortgage is a safe economical way to turn your home's equity into cash or monthly income. Access Reverse Mortgage is a family-owned company based right here in the Tampa Bay area for the past 10 years. They are A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau and Florida's leading reverse mortgage provider. Call 727-347-0305 or go to accessreverse.com to start your research today. NMLS number 4566. That's 727 727- 347-0305. From the Bright House Networks Traffic Center. Still have those big delays along I-75 in Brandon area. It's slow from the Crosstown Expressway up towards MLK. Also, the Crosstown Expressway is slow from 78th Street to 50th on the westbound side of the lower deck. Southbound 275, slow from I-4 to Howard and Armenia. Howard Franklin Bridge looking a whole lot better into Tampa. And no major delays to report along US-19 in Clearwater. See traffic problems called the injury firm of Abraham Sun and Uterwick Hillsborough Traffic Tip Line, 866-545-9595. This report is brought to you by Advance Auto Parts. Advance Auto Parts introduces Speed Perks Rewards Program. Spend $100 and get $20 off your next qualified purchase. No cards, no points, no nonsense. See details online at advanceautoparts.com. <laughs> Hot today with a 20% chance of rain, high 89. Tonight, more humid with a low 75. Tomorrow, a 20% chance of rain with a high 88. You're listening to That Business Show with Jamie Maloney on 1250 Winds WHNC. Once again, here's your host, Jamie Maloney. Welcome back, everybody, to That Business Show with Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Find the show on here weekdays at 8 a.m. here on 1250 WHNZ. And also learn more about the show over at tampabayradio.com. Currently talking with Michelle Terman. She is with a principal consultant with Catalyst Consulting Services. And uh, learn more about her over at the website catalystcs.org. And, uh, Michelle, tell me a little bit, you know, about how you were talking just uh, off the uh, show there, off the segment during the break there, about women in leadership roles. You know, what are some of the challenges that women face and what can we do to get more women in leadership roles? Well, I think some of the challenges in particular that I know I faced was as I was coming up through the ranks and becoming a CEO or even becoming an entrepreneur was finding someone that would grant you the access to even talk to them about maybe challenges that you were having. And it could range anything to, you know, how do I become more visible? How do I serve on boards in the community? Um, And just have someone to help you. And quite frankly, at least in the Tampa Bay area, we've not had many women. I mean, you have obviously Pam Iaria, you have people like Rhea Law, you have Judy Genshaft, but you don't have, I mean, those are three women. And so I think we need to be doing a better job of obviously finding out why that gap exists and also asking women such as those or people that are in these positions to also help mentor other women coming up through the process. And so that to me seemed to be the greatest need uh, moving forward and, and now where I'm at in my career and trying to, I guess, encourage women that I've met along the last 21 years to say, hey, you know, can you help another young woman up? Um, one way that I particularly do that is I work with USF's Women Leadership and Philanthropy Program, and we actually have started a mentorship program 
where we help individuals with different colleges on the campus from athletics to business and really align our members. We have over 200 women members that have phenomenal career paths or have contributed in the community that we try to match, if you will, um, to students at USF. So for example, in the case of athletics, it's wonderful if you have an athletic scholarship and you're playing basketball at USF, but you know, what's gonna happen if they don't make it into the pro arena? You know, what are you going to do? And so having a mentor talk to you about how to go on an interview, how to dress for the interview, what you encounter um, is really helpful. And so that's the one program that I've seen that's really specific to women in mentoring. I think it's really important to, to look at that. I think we have a lot of work to do when it comes to boards. Um, I always kind of uh, hearken back to a question that Alex Sink gave to Chuck Sykes one day and said, you know, I'd like to know how many women serve on your board. And he said none. And so I do think that in terms of leadership outside of being a CEO or even having your own business is what are we doing also to invite women to the table and have a say in how we're formulating business or how we're moving a business forward. Um, they tend to be very good negotiators. They tend to be people that build consensus. And so hopefully we'll, we'll cross that bridge. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of women in business. I have a relationship with the uh, Working Women of uh, Tampa Bay group. Uh, you'll hear them uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, founder and CEO Jessica Rovelli uh, every Wednesday, Working Women Wednesdays. But I love the depth and the perception that women bring to business. I mean, there's a lot of, especially the emotional component, that's something that I lack, and I'm very mindful of that fact. I'm a very logical thinker, and it, it, it helps, but it also hinders me in a number of uh, you know business uh, negotiations and positions. And so having, you know, that, you know, women, women influence is something that, you know, I think more companies need to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Now, let's talk a little bit more about your business, uh, Catalyst uh, Consulting uh, mm -hmm. Services. How do you differentiate yourself uh, from your competitors? Uh, obviously, there's probably other people that consult nonprofits uh, in, in this field. How do you differentiate yourself from your competition? Sure. Well, let's talk a little about the services that I provide. The services I provide are everything from strategic planning to working in mergers and acquisitions to also doing executive searches for the CEO and COO level, as well as executive coaching. So there are many companies out there that obviously do executive searches and coaching. But what I have found in my experiences is that they've not been a CEO. They've not been a COO. And so they're conducting a search, quite frankly, that they don't really understand the nuances of the business. It's just your typical run-of-the-mill interview process. And I think there's some skin in the game. Um, but the other piece of it is that having that experience really helps bring that skill set to the table. So some of the organizations I work with have a CEO. Some of them do not, and I work directly with the board maybe to find a CEO. But it's very non-threatening when you can come to the table and say, you know, I'm here to help you. I understand. I've been in your shoes. These are the things you need to look at from a practical standpoint. So I think that that's how I've been able to di differentiate myself. We have wonderful consultants all over Tampa Bay area and many of them build capacity with strategic planning such as we're talking about or doing operational assessments of organizations but many of them have not been in that role um, people love to build capacity and that's great but not many people want to deal with the HR issues not many people want to deal with how to make budget every week every month every year or they don't really know how to deal with a succession planning um, and quite frankly it's because they've maybe not had that experience so that's how I found uh, my referrals and, and been able to been successful and very fortunate uh, to have the clients that I have because it comes with some credibility as well. Now, do you assist uh, people with, uh, say, I just want to start a, a nonprofit, say I don't have anything. So let's say I don't even know what a 501c3 mm -hmm. is. Do you assist people from the very bottom or, or do you strictly work with existing nonprofits? Both. Um, everything from helping organizations start a nonprofit to individuals or organizations that are in crisis mode. You know, we've had a CEO, and this has happened in our area, uh, that passed away recently, or a CEO that maybe we've had a challenge with and has not been the best steward of our money, and coming in and really getting them um, operationally sound. And I also come in and can do operational assessments. So we've had some nonprofits in this area, and many have been highlighted in the paper, um, and maybe they're not being run the most efficient way. So I also come into long-term organizations and do operational assessments, which is basically like an audit, looking at their human capital, looking at their books, to see if they're really being run as efficiently as they can. Um, there's a benefit to that versus just keep hiring somebody. If you want to really retain a CEO, 
Um, some people will run a search and then they'll hire the CEO and they take on those problems and maybe they'll burn out in a year and a half they're gone. Um, so my services really provide the opportunity for somebody to come in, get it stable, so that hopefully you can retain that CEO for a long time. How do your services work? Do you come in on a contract where you have to commit to a certain length, six months to a year? Do you offer one-on-one -on -one consultations, just a one-time meeting? Tell me a little bit about how your services work. Sure. So I typically provide an initial consultation to understand the business, and then most of my clients I am usually with six to eight months. It takes at least that amount of time to come in and try to lay the groundwork for effective change. Most of the time I'll continue on with that organization and some of the next steps once you lay the groundwork. But I'm not somebody that comes in for, for example, an hourly rate. That's more of a contract employee. So people will ask me, how long is it going to take, Michelle, to establish a nonprofit? How long will it take to facilitate change? In order for me to come in and help you at least um, move the needle minimum six to eight months so typically it's on a retainer basis six to eight months mm -hmm. well great interview michelle thank you very much uh, for coming in the studio today and some great information thank you thank you very much and that was michelle Turman with catalyst consulting services learn more about her at catalystcs.org well we got to wrap it up i'll be back in here tomorrow morning at 8 a.m uh, i'll be working women wednesday so uh, be sure sure to tune in for that we got two people coming in from the working women of tampa bay networking group and again you've been listening to that business show with jamie maloney we're business becomes show business.